This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 742, recorded on April 9th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hey, um, it is pretty nice here. Could be a little nicer. It's gray, but it's 57 Fahrenheit, and that's a lot better than it was all winter, so I'll take that. Yep, we're in the warming up period here. Before you know it, it'll be winter again, though, Brianne. It goes really <laughs> fast. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. <laughs> also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is, get this, 93 here today. That's unseasonably warm because um, uh, like tomorrow it's going to be 82 and tonight it's going to be go down to 60. Okay. And next week it's going to be down in the seventies again, but that's the way it is today. Mid nineties and kind of hazy. What's the humidity? Uh, oh, geez. Just, uh, I got it here. 48%. So you've probably been out, right? So it feels humid, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not bad. 48% is not bad. Um, and it'll cool off by evening. Good time. We've, uh, my wife and I sort of manage our walking, which we are semi-religious about, depending on the weather. So we're now into evening walking for the time being. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. And in a rare development, I win the weather today. It is 66 Fahrenheit, clear blue skies. It is freaking gorgeous in Western Mass. We got like three days a year like this. Um, wow, blue skies. It's very unusual for mud season, but we have a, a gorgeous day. Did you put and here you are inside. Yes, here I am sitting inside. But, uh, you know, I'm talking to you all. So. Well, we, uh, Brianne and I were chatting about being outside. We decided we have both been outside for five minutes today. How about you guys more? <laughs> uh, I, I manage more than that. As a matter of fact, I uh, routinely now manage quite a bit of time in my garden, mm. which I have uh, learned to enjoy. I was out for um, almost an hour this morning doing yard work nice. and getting things ready. And I've um, I've got some uh, seeds starting, tomato seeds and pepper seeds starting in the basement uh, under a grow light. So we'll be planting a vegetable garden for the first time in several years. So getting started. Excellent. Nice. You know, even when I'm home, I can't, I can't garden. I have to do work because that's a weekday. You know, I'm still in that head, <laughs> that head game where... Because my wife says, can you help me move this dirt? And no, I, I'm, this is at work. This is work day. I can't. <laughs> but maybe I should be more flexible, right? Because on weekends, I, yeah, I go out and do the garden. And then Monday, she says, we have to do this. I said, oh, it has to wait till Saturday. <laughs> well, I know, I know what you mean. You know, you sort of uh, figure out how you're going to balance all that stuff. Everybody yeah. has their own way. I could. I could. It's just that... Well, I'm teaching. the The days are kind of full, so but the You're class still working stiff, you know. I'm a working stiff. I am getting a salary, so I say I got to work for my salary, right? Yeah. And uh, I'm teaching the class next week or the last two lectures, though, so that'll free up some time on Mondays and and uh, Wednesdays. So now today we have a paper for you, and uh, since we did a non-COVID paper on Tuesday, today we'll do a COVID paper. And then just so Kathy doesn't get left out, we'll do a COVID paper Tuesday and a non-COVID next Friday. Hey, Ooh. talk about lists. Actually, I don't make lists, but I kind of get things in my head and forget about them or whatever. But today's paper is very cool. If it were not COVID, if it weren't a pandemic virus, I would still do it because it's really interesting. It is a Nature article, Drugs That Inhibit. TMEM16 proteins block SARS-CoV-2 spike-induced syncytia. And the reason I like this paper, first of all, it's published. It's been peer-reviewed. Trying as much as possible to move away from preprints in the last few weeks. Not because we can't deal with them, but I just feel better. And this one is good science, and it may also help treat COVID-19. So interesting combination. Uh, the first two co-authors, Luca Braga, wasn't that someone from like The Godfather? <laughs> Luca Brazzi, Sleeps Brazzi. with the Fishes. That's yes. right, Luca Brazzi <laughs> and Hashim Ali. 
Last author is Mauro Giacca. Um, and a, a number of institutions, uh, King's College, the MRC Center for, uh, that's also King's College, King's College, Imperial College, London, King's College. Uh, then we have the University of Trieste, which is over in Italy, and then some company in Trieste, Instituto, yeah, Instituto Biophysica, which is CNR. I have to say this, Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca. <laughs> I don't often get to say Italian words. Uh, it's a nice collaboration. This is cool because um, they want to look at potential inhibitors of fusion, but not as we're thinking, you know, fusion inhibitors in the not viral targets, but cell targets. And I want to remind everyone what fusion is. Remember, we talked about this quite a bit. The SARS-CoV-2 binds the cell. It could, the membrane can either fuse at the cell surface or it could be endocytosed and fused within the endosome, depending on whether uh, there's a protease on the surface that's needed for entry or within the endosome. So the spike catalyzes fusion. And um, when cells are infected, they're displaying spike on the surface. And I have to say, it, coronaviruses bud into the ergic inside the cell, right? The ER Golgi intermediate. So the spike is put into that compartment, the virus buds in, then it's brought to the surface by vesicular transport. But some spike ends up on the surface. And if a cell's next to a spike producing cell, they could fuse, right? Because the spike will catalyze fusion. If the protease is on the surface, that will allow fusion. And when yeah, I want to I want to riff on that for a second as yeah. a as a generalization. There are some so viruses that have a lipid around them are called envelope viruses, and SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. Not all uh, viruses uh, are structured that way. Some have just protein on the outside. Those are usually called capsids, and an envelope virus. Ah, is that polio? There we go. It is no envelope, right? No envelope. An envelope virus. Uh, basically can uh, assemble a couple of different ways. One of which is to uh, ship the envelope protein, the equivalent of the spike, to the plasma membrane of the cell and then bud through that. So you generate a particle in the process of budding out. HIV does this, okay? Another way to do it is, as was done with SARS-CoV-2, is to actually do all that assembly using intracellular membrane compartments inside the cell. So you've assembled the virus inside the cell and then export it. And it, it's taken me a while to sort of sort this out. So the, the normal SARS-CoV-2 evolution does not necessarily involve having a bunch of spike bristling on the surface. But as Vincent just said, that nevertheless, since it is a membrane protein and all the membranes, uh, you know, are kind of interconnected and traffic with each other, you can have spike, pro uh, spike protein on the surface of an infected cell. Right. And so if you kind of think about this process, uh, generally the way Rich talked about it, um, any of those enveloped viruses that have um, their spike proteins or their envelope proteins on the surface of a cell could potentially um, have this situation of fusing with other cells um, if that envelope protein is sort of competent for fusion. Um, the And I say that because the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein needs to be cleaved. Um, and so the protease has to be around in order to allow this fusion to happen. Um, in some cases, there isn't a cleavage step necessary. And so those viruses can uh, lead to infected cells fusing with other cells, um, which is uh, known as making syncytia. And that's known for some other viruses um, So well. the SARS-CoV-2 surface protease, Tempress-2, we've talked about a bit. So if that's on the surface, then in theory, you know, a spike on a neighboring cell could fuse with that cell. And then if many cells fuse, as Brian said, that it's called a syncytium and they have typically many nuclei and other viruses do that. Measles is one. And in the old days, when we had a lot of measles, you could almost diagnose it. Look in the mouth of a kid. There are these white spots called coplic spots and they are syncytia. You could take a little scraping and look at it under the microscope and that would have syncytia in them. And syncytia also occur 
naturally in non-viral situations, I mean, in the placenta and other structures and mm-hmm. also in some organisms, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, it, it's always kind of cheating to cite fungi because they do everything weird. But there, <laughs> there are slime molds, for example, that, that form syncytia as part of their life cycle. So this is this is something that biology repeats because it's a process of just fusing membranes and then you have this multi-cell structure. And this may be obvious, but just to make sure, this whole fusion thing is not just a sideshow. Because we have a virus that's got a membrane around it trying to invade a cell that's got a membrane around it. And the way ultimately that's accomplished is to fuse the two membranes so that the virus can dump its contents into the cell. So this is a an important function of the protein. And uh, keeping it um, uh, happening at the right time and under the right circumstances is uh, an issue. Yeah. Now, what- in- inhibiting fusion has been used in other viral infections as kind of a drug target. Yeah, so- HIV, there's an HIV fusion inhibitor, and that targets the spike. Uh, but today we're going to talk about a cell target. One more thing in- of interest is that you can produce just the spike in a cell, and you can make syncytia in cell culture. And they that happens for SARS-CoV-2 and MERS. CoV, but not SARS-CoV-1, interestingly. You don't get syncytia formation. And they say that's because there's no multi-basic cleavage site in the SARS-CoV-1 spike. So it doesn't work at the cell surface. It has to be uh, within the endosome. So I, I have a question that I'm not sure of. I have often thought of fusion or syncytia formation as uh, a potential mechanism for spread of an infection. In, a, in an infected host, because obviously that if you take an infected cell and fuse it with an uninfected cell, then now you've essentially infected the uninfected cell. Is yeah. that Makes sense. a reasonable? Well, uh, yeah, you got the RNA. Even if the particles are not made yet, sure. You could right. transfer the replication complexes to another cell. Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Yeah, and this is a feature that I, I think somebody already mentioned. It's sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. And in some viruses, yeah. it's... It occurs occasionally, but it's not the main pathogenic route. And in other viruses, it's the main pathogenic route. You know, we have respiratory syncytial virus, which yep. is named after the fact that yeah. it does <laughs> That's this. Right. Um, That's right. So then, obviously, a question that comes up for SARS-CoV-2, newly discovered virus. Uh, there's this pandemic going on. What's the pathology? And that's where this paper comes in and narrows in on syncytia. By the way... Influenza viruses do not produce syncytia. And the reason is that fusion requires low pH. And so only that that's only available in the endosome. And so even though you have spike on the surface of neighboring cells, they don't fuse because it's neutral pH. Okay. And and the measles respiratory syncytia, uh, they happen at the cell surface because fusion like that of SARS-CoV-2 can happen at neutral pH. Just need 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 to have the spike uh, the uh, fusion peptide exposed. So the, their their idea was to say, let, let's see if uh, syncytia are involved in the pathogenesis of COVID nineteen. So they took uh, forty one patients who had died of COVID uh, last year at University Hospital in Trieste. That was a period when it was not a problem to find people who had died of uh, COVID, if you remember. It was a horrible yeah, this outbreak. Yeah, this was March March to May 2020. So this is right when Italy was just in the big first surge. Yep. And if you're interested in the detailed post-mortem analysis, it will be published elsewhere. But what they say here, we saw, you know, what we expect, alveolar damage, thrombosis, fibrosis, but... Also, and they seem to be surprised, in 90% of the patients, syncytia, what looked like syncytia, uh, showing big cells with 2 to 20 nuclei. It sure sounds like syncytia to me, right? And yeah, they, the, figure, the figure looks pretty uh, yeah. obvious and looks pretty nice. Pretty syncytial, yeah. And, yes, and this is open access too. Yes. And they say these are pneumocytes, a specific type of lung cell, because they could stain them with uh, antibodies to very pneumocyte-specific markers. And they also contain viral RNA, which they can do, they can find by in-situ hybridization. So you make a, an, a probe 
hybridization probe and you design it in a way that so you can see the hybridization, you add it to the cells and you permeabilize them, add it to the cells and you can see a signal. So these appear to be virus infected and they're syncytia. And that's very interesting because, you know, that could contribute to the pathology, right? Uh, and so they're thinking, um, all right, so these are probably occurring because the, the spike protein is fusion, fusing. Um, so let's see if we can do something about this. And something we ought to bear in mind throughout this paper is because of the nature of the samples, these are people who died of COVID-19. We're looking at the late game. That's right. So this is yeah. we. This is not necessarily something that's driving all the pathogenesis or much of the pathogenesis or anything like this. Is something that you definitely see in people who got severe COVID nineteen and died of it, uh, and it, it may be occurring in in earlier phases too. Sure. Um, yeah, but no, I think uh, that matters a lot for what they find. That's a good point because you don't know if these syncytia are contributing in any way to pathogenesis, right, to disease. And it may, but I guess you would only find that out if you could prevent it, right? Yeah. <laughs> At some yeah, point. And, and it's pretty clear they're not helping. I mean, the lung pathology yeah. is bad, and this is, this is definitely part of the lung pathology. So they did a few experiments um, in cell culture. And the first thing they did, and this relates to last Friday's, to have, they make a codon-optimized spike protein DNA. So optimize the codons. Remember, we talked about that for the respiratory syncytial codon deoptimized virus. Was that Tuesday, right? I don't even, yeah, Tuesday, not Friday. It was Tuesday. Sorry. And um, when they just produced the, the spike, the Vero cells, which is what they are using here, uh, form syncytia. And um, these, you know, the, the other cells that, in the culture, they all have ACE2, of course, right? And so they did a cool experiment. They take uh, cells which don't have ACE2 and they put them in culture with their Vero cells uh, with spike. And um, wait, why would they fuse? <laughs> mm. Culturing spike transfected U2OS, which have undetectable ACE with. Oh yeah, so the Vero's are fusing with the U2OS, I suppose, because the Vero's have the ACE and the U2OS have the spike, yeah. And you can see that. And they can tell which cell is which because they have green fluorescent protein in the Vero cells. And then you can see the transfer of that protein to, to the other cells. Right, so the importance of this mix and match experiment is that now that's, a pr that's pretty strong evidence that it is in fact ACE2 and spike. Yeah. It's not yeah. some other molecules that happen to be on the surface of these cells. Now, they look closer at these cells, the, the Vero cells that are making syncytia, and they say, this is very important, they projected a remarkable number of plasma membrane protrusions, like philopodia, little, little bits of the membrane that They're stick out. They're reaching out, out. yeah. Um, and um, contacting the membrane of neighboring cells, okay? Don't, don't pox viruses hit philopodia or do, do something with philopodia? Yeah, they've got their own uh, specialized uh, philopodia that they do. That's TWIV 68, man, <laughs> Ode to a Plaque. Okay, one of my absolute favorite episodes that they, uh, the pox viruses actually, um, uh, in a sense, direct the manufacture of these things. Uh, and there's a, a virion perched on the end of each one and they actually project out from the cell and plant the virion <laughs> on a neighboring uninfected cell. Uh, that's a very unusual, very specialized thing, but yes, that happens. Now, the cool thing here is they say these cells that are making spike and forming syncytia, they have calcium transients, you know, little spikes of calcium. Now you would say, how would they know that? They looked for it <laughs> because you can, you can put a fluorescent calcium sensor protein into the cell and it will fluoresce when there's spikes of, of calcium. Very cool, right? And they have some videos here which show these spikes. So in the process of syncytia, you're getting calcium spikes. And, so, and that's kind of important because you, typically your cytoplasm is 
basically free from having any calcium in it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the fact that there's calcium in the cytoplasm either means there's some kind of signaling happening to release the calcium that's stored in the ER, mm-hmm. or maybe there's some uh, hole in the plasma membrane that's letting in some calcium from outside. Um, right. So some some kind of interesting event is happening in order to induce yeah. those calcium yeah, spikes. Yeah, normally the right. calcium and, is and in calcium, the ER. Yeah. Calcium is not a random choice here. It's, it's an important signaling tool that the cell will deploy, as Brianne said, you know, from these various compartments. So something's going on, and that's good that they looked at that. So they do the same experiment with uh, SARS-CoV-1 spike, no syncytia formation, but MERS-CoV spike does it. They say, and I like this word, syncytiogenic. <laughs> I have not heard that one before, but I like it. It's got a nice yeah. feel to it, syncytiogenic. Just ask someone what syncytiogenic, I bet most people won't know. Well, if you know what a syncytium is, you could probably figure out what syncytiogenic genic is. Tells, leading to the formation of syncytia, they could say, but, you know, mm. then they, but I don't know what a syncytia. Okay, so <laughs> then they said, let's find some drugs to inhibit this fusion, this syncytium formation. Um, and so they developed two assays to do high throughput screening of drug collections, which you can buy, <laughs> right? The Prestwick Chemical Library and the Spectrum Collection. So you call these companies up and you say, give me all the drugs. Yep. And they do. They and give three, you these panels uh, of, um, the important thing about these is these are clinically approved, approved FDA, yeah. EMA approved drugs. Um, and they're kind of the first thing everybody goes to in drug screening. Because, yeah, you can synthesize compounds ad nauseum and screen millions of things. And you never know what you'll get. And then you got to go through clinical trials. But if if you get a hit in one of these... You got an approved drug and it it does something. Yeah. So they, they look at it. It's like 33,000, basically about 3,000 unique molecules yeah. they're looking at. These are small molecules. So their assays involve the fusion. That One of them is the, the fusion between Vero and, and U2OS cells and the other is a Vero cell. But basically they add the drugs in a high throughput manner, which, which means in wells, uh, plates with many wells, and the robots can do it for you. They can add all the ingredients and then you have a readout that you're quickly screening. So they go through all this screening, uh, and they get they get hits. Um, you know, 57 drugs from one, 84 drugs from the other, uh, and the um, top hit in one and the second hit in the other library is niclosamide, niclosamide, which I'd not heard of before, but it is a drug used. To treat certain worm infections. Too bad Dixon isn't here. He could, he could start talking about it, right? I'm sure he could. Uh, and, um, and a bunch of others, as you will see. So that's a fusion inhibition. So then they say, let's take some of these top hits and check out infection, right? Infect cells. They put 10 micromolar drugs and they look at protection against cytopathic effect and, and they look at uh, reduction of viral yields. But they say, this is very interesting, uh, in terms of, so when you put virus on cells and it reproduces, the cells develop cytopathic effects, including syncytia formation and, and other dying and so forth. They say, we f- they found cells in different categories they, and they selected for further analysis, one antihistaminic drug, one antidepressant, and one antileprotic antibiotic. Um, leprosy, clofazimine, and they had. Then they also added niclosamide and another selenomycin. Um, these were cytotoxic at 10 micromolar, um, but they said, "Yeah, they're really good at preventing fusion, so let's keep studying them." It's interesting. They're cytotoxic. Normally, you would have thrown it out, probably, but this niclosamide is approved. <laughs> For something yeah, so else. one of the things that comes up in these in these assays is a lot of these drugs were approved a long, long time ago before you had the modern assays. And and so you get stuff sometimes popping up in these screens that has the desired effect. And then it does something weird. And you think, would I even pursue this as a drug now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's it works, apparently. Yeah. So then they, then they look at virus production, you know, by... Infecting cells uh, in the presence of in- increasing amounts of drugs, and they measure virus in the supernatant by IC50 assays. No plaque assays, but IC50 assays. And they get inhibitory values 
you know, 50% inhibitory values of these different drugs. Some are more potent than others. Um, you know, niclosamide was, was pretty good. Clofazamine was less potent. And they also did it in lung cells, which is good. Uh, but they say the, in fact, the cells uh, infected in the presence of niclosamide were no, no, no longer syncytial. Which makes sense because that's the way they scored it in the first place, right? They looked for an inhibition of fusion. So now we have a bunch of drugs and what they would like to know is how they work. And they say, I love this little logic here. We were intrigued by the observation that our assays had selected for specific drug classes. In particular, 11 were antipsychotics, eight were antidepressants, and five were first generation histamine receptor antagonists. And what they all have in common is they regulate intracellular calcium, right? So kind of a good story, you know, when you get all these different results, try and find something in common. It all converges on this, on it's, it's pointing in the same direction. Yeah. Right. And, and one of the, so the H1 receptor, for example, um, when that is, um, bound by its ligand, it ends up releasing calcium from the ER. And the others all do different things. So they all end up um, causing changes in calcium levels. All right, so that's good. And so they said, next, let's see what happens to calcium when we produce spike in cells, right? And when cells fuse. And, you know, we already had kind of a hint of this, right? That there's, there are calcium spikes. So... This makes a lot of sense. So they do some uh, dynamic imaging. Uh, and they say when, when we put spike in cells, when cells produce spike and they make syncytia, you get cal calcium oscillations, intracellular calcium oscillations. And this is another figure that is rather dramatic. Yeah. Um, seeing that oscillation um, when they add spike, uh, it, it's, it's not one that you're going to miss uh, yeah. on this figure. <laughs> Now, with this, over this period of 400 minutes, which is what they did, the cells that make spike progressively fused and had frequent calcium oscillation. So this is an association. There seems to be fusion and calcium oscillation. We don't know how they're related yet, but we're going to find out. Um, the, um, uh, the supplemental material has a bunch of videos in it. Yeah. Um, and cool. they have some videos of this calcium signaling where you stick these floors into the cells and the way I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have something that's a calcium-dependent fluorescence. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And these floors enter the cytoplasm. They don't have access to the ER. But if the ER releases cytoplasm, you get this pulse of fluorescence. And that's you right watch now? these cells, and they pulse. Yeah, it's okay? cool. And you, cool. Can, you can see that in real time. So they they thinking now that the spike production is somehow amplifying what would normally be spontaneous calcium transients. And again, the spike from SARS-CoV doesn't do this, this oscillation of calcium, but the MERS-CoV spike does. Now, niclosamide and clofazamine, they blunt the amplitude and frequency of these calcium oscillations in cells that have the spike. Ah, so that's starting to make sense, right? <laughs> um and they have another drug, which is interesting because it inhibited syncytia, but didn't do anything to the calcium, which is suggesting there's something else going on. And obviously it's not just calcium, right? But there are other pathways. So that's a cool one. Okay, so calcium infusion spike somehow related. Um, another interesting experiment, uh, they treat cells um, with two inhibitors of the ER calcium ATPase which basically depletes calcium from the ER. So they treat them a long time and then they do the experiment. What do you think happens? No oscillations, right? And they say also if you remove calcium from the medium of the cells, the same thing happens. So the conclusion from all this is that the ER, as Brianne mentioned earlier, is the storage place for the calcium that's leading to these oscillations induced by the production of the spike. The, um, these drugs, by the way, that deplete calcium from the ER, they inhibit syncytia formation. It makes sense, right? That's a nice connection there. But the cells are okay, apparently. They don't impact cell viability, they say. Anyway, so 
If Everyone. you use a high dose, uh, at least of thapsigargan, it will cells don't really feel seem to be too happy. Turn, yeah, it turns on stress pathways, right? Yeah, I think it turns on EIF two alpha kinases shuts down. It's a way to turn on uh, phosphorylation of EIF two, which will shut down translation. Because I remember from translation paper, that's a commonly used one. All right, so uh, next part of this story is the previous knowledge that niclosamide is an inhibitor of this family of chloride channels and I love this one, scramblases. Scramblases, yeah. yes. So, so you know what? <laughs> if you go Google scramblase, they're not just scramblases. There are flipases. And flop aces. Flop aces, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so cool. I mean, these these are proteins that, you know, the phospholipid bilayer is, it has different phospholipids on the on the outside and the inside, and these enzymes can flip them. Or uh, scramble them. Scramble them, yeah. Scrambling is what it is. They can transport. So the negatively charged phospholipids are on the inner leaflet, and they can be flipped to the outer. And that's, so that's what this can do. But it's also... Uh, a channel. It's a chloride channel, TMEM16, which is in the title of the paper. It's a chloride channel, and it is inhibited by niclosamide. I just want to know when they figured all this out, right? Because it's presented in a nice logical way. I wonder if they knew this ahead of time. I, I'm oh, pretty uh, sure the experiments were not done in the order presented. Uh, exactly. So this uh, TMEM16 uh, is found in, they looked at the expression levels and it's found in many, pri it's in primary bronchial human airway epithelial cells, which is good. Um, and it's also in a number of other cell lines. And guess what? When you produce spike in cells, the production of this protein goes up. So it's TMEM16 goes up when you produce spikes in cells. So then they ask, well, is the activity actually impacted by spike? Is it not just the amount of protein, but is the activity impacted? So then they get into a little um, electricity. <laughs> they they want to measure voltage currents uh, in these cells. They do whole cell voltage clamp recordings of HEC-293 cells, and they can measure the, the current carried by this particular channel. Uh, and uh, they could find current going through these channels and that current passage requires high intracellular calcium. The current goes down if you knock down TMEM16. This is a typical nature paper. One sentence has like 20 different experimental results yes. in it. It's incredibly dense. And, uh, the other inhibitors of uh, TMEM16 block this, uh, this this voltage. All right, so they're saying this current is carried by these channels. And in fact, niclosamide also blocks the voltage, this current that they see going through this channel. Um, and so HEC293 cells that produce spike and ACE2, they make this current also through this particular channel. So the idea is that spike production leads to activation of this channel, TMEM16, TMEM16, and it's inhibited by niclosamide. All right, so that's cool. So there's voltage going through this channel, but what does it have to do with syncytia formation? That's one of the, that's the, the next link. So if you knock down TMEM16, then these calcium transients that are caused by spike protein production are are inhibited. So we've now linked this TMEM16 to the earlier transients of calcium. Um, and you also inhibit these transients by knocking down ACE2 as well, which makes sense because spike is binding to ACE2 to, to form these syncytia. The other thing that happens now is we bring in phosphatidylserine, one of these membrane phospholipids, normally on the inner leaflet of the, the bilayer. And the scramblase is gonna gonna flip it to the upper. Flip it yes. to the upper, and they found that if they knock down levels of TMEM16 in cells, that almost completely pre prevents externalization of phosphatidylserine, which will happen when you when you 
treat them with a calcium ionophore, which lets calcium into the cell. So, so basically the, they're faking out the cell, giving it a, a drug that makes it seem like there's ex extra calcium in the cytoplasm and showing that that induces the flipping, um, yeah. this scramblase activity. So there's more phosphatidylserine on the um, outside leaflet of the membrane. And then they can do, they can knock down TMEM and show that that blocks this. Right. So TMEM 16, they say, is the main scramblase responsible, responsive to calcium in these cells. So, I mean, the flipping of phosphatidylserine, this, this often happens when cells are going to die, right? Like mm -hmm. apoptosis is involved in flipping and so forth. It, it does, but it also is linked to a few other um, cellular processes. So actually when cells are rapidly dividing, mm -hmm. um, their membranes seem to be in flux as well. I guess it's linked, as we're going to see eventually, it's linked to uh, fusion, right? Yes. Yeah. All right, so TMEM16 is the main scramblase uh, responsive to calcium. And in fact, when they treat cells with niclosamide, which inhibits TMEM16, it reduces externalized PS, phosphatidylserine, um, in response to the, ion the, the calcium ionophore. So um, the, the drug is preventing calcium flux through this channel and also the flipping, the scramblase activity. I always think of eggs when I see this scramblaze. Yes. Yeah, I've got <laughs> eggs. I got eggs in my head the whole time. Yeah. We could have put that in the title: scrambled <laughs> eggs and SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so scrambled SARS-CoV-2. Scrambled SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> so, so now the um, last set of experiments uh, is TMEM16 involved in syncytia formation. We have all kinds of associations. We have relationships to calcium flux. We have relationships to flipping the phosphatidylserine. So what they do is knock down a variety of uh, proteins, ACE2, TMEM16, in a, in a few cells. And if you knock down TM, TMEM16, you blunt syncytia formation in cells that make spike, which is a similar effect if you knock down the receptor, ACE2. So it's really finally this protein TMEM2, the target of niclosamide, originally picked up by inhibition of syncytia. TMEM16 is required for syncytia formation. And I, I think that's a really cool result. And that all fits together nicely because the cal calcium is necessary. Um, mm -hmm. The TMEM16 is responding to the calcium. TMEM16 is necessary probably because the calcium activation. And so you've got this whole thing fitting together into a mechanistic cascade uh, for niclosamide stopping the syncytium formation. Uh, but in terms of the ultimate effect of syncytium formation, my impression is that what's critical in that is the phosphatidylserine flipped to the outside right. of the membrane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because that makes, you know, sort of structural sense. Is that your impression as well? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that was my so impression. It to, yeah, that was it, uh, there ought to be uh, additional experiments that could be done to, by other pathways or uh, uh, other than just inducing this protein, but uh, and I don't know what methods would be appropriate, of completely independently enriching the outer leaflet on cells with phosphatidylserine and seeing if you get the same effect in the presence of spike. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly... Um, Knocking down TMEM16 had no effect on syncytia formation caused by mers cov spike, suggesting it's working through some other, right. maybe a related protein or something else. So they say, for future investigation. <laughs> I like that. And we also had a, another drug that seemed to be inhibiting yeah. fusion by some other pathway. Yeah. So yeah. there's more than one way to skin this cat. A good paper yeah. raises more questions than it answers. It and does. I think that's what's does. going on here. It does. Um, oh, and then finally, um, if you knock down TMEM16, you impair the production of infectious SARS-CoV-2. So that's via a knockdown. And so it's interesting because maybe the, the niclosamide, which also inhibited virus production, it's going to inhibit fusion so it could have a double effect on um, pathogenesis by not just inhibiting the cell damage, but the production of virus as well, right? 
So, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on here and the potential uses. So they say we can envision three mechanisms by which Spike activates TMEM16. That's really, so they showed that it's activated by Spike, but how is that happening? Um, so they say this can happen on S producing cells. So those cells that make Spike can activate, the Spike can activate TMEM on those cells or it can happen on the cell to which spike binds, um, you know, in trans. Or perhaps, and this is what I was thinking, indirectly through activation of calcium release, right? Um, so I guess they're thinking spike may, I guess the, I, activating the channel will activate calcium release, right? Because it's a it's right. a calcium channel, right. so the calcium comes out of the cell, and would that be a signal for flipping? Where I guess team team M sixteen is already a scramblase, so if it's activated as a channel, maybe it's also activated for scram for uh, uh, flipase activity. Well, I think the, the calcium calcium spike inside the cell activates team M as a scramblase, right? Is that what we think is, is going on? Yeah. Yeah. So the cal the calcium but the, changes the. the, the the fossil hill serine exposure but in the, their but, ionomycin experiments. But the spike also al activates TMEM as a channel, as a calcium channel. I mean, that lets right. calcium into the cell or out. Which way is it going? It's, it's probably letting it into the cell. Um, and so yeah. this may be kind of, you know, almost positive feedback and further inducing uh, the calcium spike in the cell. And since calcium is used for so many types of intracellular signaling things, there may be mm. a whole lot more signaling that goes on because of this calcium. Mm -hmm. To me, there's a missing link here, however, okay? Because mm -hmm. you can say Spike does this or that, but uh, I don't see a I don't see a how. That's right. I agree. Okay? It doesn't. I, 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 I don't. I don't understand how exactly Spike would do any of these things. No. Once you set off You're the right. cascade, fine. I agree. The mechanisms are not really mechanisms. They're just where it's happening, right? Yeah. Not how. I I agree with that. That's right. They have. They have. Um, I think good mechanistic insight on what niclosamide is doing, but less yeah. mechanistic insight on what Spike is doing. Either way, the the team M16 is important for for fusion, and yeah, so that's why niclosamide works to prevent fusion. But how how this is connected with Spike, we don't know yet. And I, I assume they can find out at some point. Um, nevertheless, it's an interesting clinical observation. Um, about before we get to that, I wanted to talk about phosphatidylserine exposure which we touched on briefly, they say the involvement of TMEM in syncytia formation is consistent with the role of PS exposure in most other physiological cell fusion events, like fusion of macrophages, osteoclasts, myoblasts, cytotrophoblasts uh, in the placenta, and sperm egg fusion. All that <laughs> involves exposure of PS on the cell surface. That's very cool. And, and myoblast and uh, placental development, TMEM16 is involved. Those are very cool. This is a broadly involved process. Not surprising because fusion is conserved. And viruses didn't invent anything, right? They just stole it. They just stole it. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because people <laughs> would say, you're anthropomorphizing. <laughs> but no one's listening. It's okay. <laughs> well, so in the, the macrophage example that they mentioned, yeah. um, I know a little bit about the fossil hill serine receptor that's on some macrophages um, that's involved in this. And so I think that could be another piece to all of this yeah. um, is there could be some sort of fossil hill serine receptor that they aren't talking about here. So, uh, Brianne, I was thinking about this because my understanding is, as Vincent said, this uh, flipping fossil serine to the outside of a cell is a part of apoptosis. Mm -hmm. I forget how we're supposed to pronounce that. <laughs> as, <you> want. <laughs> uh, as cells are dying. And my understanding is that macrophages see that and uh, eat those dead bits of cells. Exactly. And that's, how does that eating happen? Is that, that's the uptake? Phosphatidyl is, that a, is that a fusion? It's, it's phosphatidylserine. I have always learned it as phosphatidylserine receptor induces phagocytosis. Okay. Of those apoptotic bodies. Obviously, somewhere the membranes would have to fuse. Right. Whether it's after phagocytosis or sort of mid, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Okay. Rich, the, you, you were in um, 
Kansas, right? For the Twiv. Yes, you were with with Wendy Morey, right? You remember? Yeah. So that's her shtick. That PS receptor is a receptor for Ebola virus. Because Ebola virus is decorated with that's TS. Right. Right? That's right. <laughs> All right. So the, here's the here's the connection mechanistically. This is their model, and there's a, there's a figure. Cells producing spike. They have increased calcium oscillations. They have increased TMEM16 channels, and all of that leads to externalization of PS. And they also say chloride secretion, which I don't remember seeing any chloride here. Do you? Um, uh, is T was TMEM a TMEM part of the TMEM is a chloride channel. Yeah. So I don't know that they measured it, but that would be an, uh, uh, an obvious consequence. Yeah, it's a chloride channel. That's right. That's absolutely right. Um, right. So that and phosphatidylserine going outside, as you just said, is a it's sort of an eat me signal. It's a phagocytosis stimulating, yeah, which may, would help in the okay. syncytia formation. Okay. I may have mentioned, I may have said it's a calcium channel several times, and that shouldn't. That's not correct. It's a chloride it's channel. A chloride channel. Okay. So just go back and erase when I said that. The search and replace. Yeah. Um, now they say that. Uh, so. The um, flipping is probably needed for fusion, but they say the chloride secretion may also have relevance in pathogenesis of COVID-19, right? So that could be, and that's important to keep in mind. I think that's cool. Uh, and then they have, um, uh, they talk about all the drugs they scored as uh, inhibiting fusion. So besides niclosamide, there are other drugs there that inhibit TMEM16, and they list a whole bunch of them. And... Ivermectin is one of them. It scored positive in their screen. It wasn't high up, yeah. I suppose. And they say it might inhibit TMEM16. And I just wonder if that may be part of why it may have some activity, right? A lot of people think Ivermectin works. I, I just don't know. But the clinical data suggests that it's not proving all that useful, right? Yeah, that's my feeling. But you know, people are very uh, passionate I know people about are very, that. People have gotten very tribal about, uh, <laughs> well, this drug must work because I saw a patient recover after they took uh, it. That's okay, right. Well. How about this person who's treated hundreds of yeah. patients and they've all survived? And I just don't know what yeah. to make of that because there's no data. It's just a hearsay, right? <laughs> it's just, Exactly. And, and when you're dealing with a virus where the majority of patients are going to survive... Um, there's going to be a huge amount of noise in there. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, they, they survive, but how do you know they wouldn't have it absent that drug? And so finally, this drug, niclosamide, has been approved, of course, for um, tapeworm infections of humans. And so um, they say, you know, it could be useful because it's antiviral and it could also improve the pathogenesis. And they say... Uh, you know, TMEM participate in other in a aspects of inflammation. You know, it inflammation, thrombosis, dysfunction of endothelial cells, edema, diarrhea through increased chloride se secretion. A lot of the patients have gastrointestinal issues. Maybe something's going on with that. So, um, you know, you could imagine uh, perhaps not just inhibiting virus. Well, the problem is that you'd have to give this very early an infection for it to have an antiviral function. But maybe if you didn't, it would still have helped people in COVID with lung disease. anti, anti yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. one of the things going back to the fact that these are, these are the, this all came from dead patients. This all came yeah, from that's right. that's late right. stage. And so the syncytia formation is certainly a phenomenon that's going on in late stage of the disease. It is probably going on in the early stage of the disease. Um, still unclear how much it contributes to the pathogenesis, but it's certainly not a good thing. And um, given niclosamide, one of the reasons they zoomed in on it is because it it was very active in their assay and it was active at a very low concentration. And in fact, I think they see like at a one micromolar, which is which is a dose that is achieved therapeutically when you give this for tapeworm. So it all fits together into something. And, and since, I mean, this thing was developed in the 1950s, it's off patent, it's cheap, it's ubiquitous. You should be able to get a hold of it. Um, it's probably worth trying. Um, and I hope when somebody tries it, they actually assemble data systematically um, rather than just saying, oh, we treated a patient with it and they lived. Oh, we treated somebody else and they died. Well, um, there are 13... <laughs> Trials at clinicaltrials.gov for niclosamide and COVID. 
Oh, okay. Some of them are recruiting um, moderate to severe COVID. Oh, and look at there's one. This is interesting. One, it was a combination of niclosamide and hydroxychloroquine. That's been withdrawn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there are a bunch of them. Um, some are recruiting. So yeah, we'll see if it works. Uh, we'll see. Interesting. Interesting. And I wonder if those began long before this. Because they do say in the paper, and I, I didn't mention it, that it's been found to uh, inhibit the reproduction of uh, some other viruses in culture, right? Where was that? Mm, yeah, here it goes. It'll be reported to be active against envelope and non-envelope viruses. Yeah, I don't know what it would be doing against the non-envelope virus, right? Because there's no syncytia formation, but something else, I suppose. Uh, I just wonder if it was, I mean, this is just published, but do you think those trials were started long before this came? Maybe. Hmm. Yeah, there has there has very much been a throw the whole medicine medicine chest at it uh, approach. Yeah. And, <laughs> throw the whole medicine chest. I like that. Very good. Yeah, and, and it says here that this paper was received by Nature in July 2020. Wow. I don't know if there were any preprints or any other you know previous discussions of the data, but this may have been in the pipeline for yeah. a while. I kind of like it because it's it's different and it's looking at the cell target and it's mechanistically we're thinking about fusion a bit, although we don't understand exactly how, uh, you know, TMEM is involved, but we're getting hints. So I, I liked it for that reason. I thought it was yeah. good. And, it and even if niclosamide doesn't pan out, none of these drugs pan out, um, I think the mechanistic insights here are really cool and are pointing in a direction of addressing syncytia formation, which as we've said, is a common thing that occurs and could be very important, if not in pathogenesis of this virus, then certainly for others. Maybe, yeah. That's a good the question, is whether syncytia makes a difference or it's just something right. that right. happens, you know. But uh, I think you might be able to find out. Okay, so yeah, that's cool. But by one, one technical thing here, uh, you know, I work on a Mac and preview I usually use to open PDFs. And when you open this one, this is a, you know, a accelerated article preview. And when you try and highlight a sentence, these big blocks get highlighted. Very frustrating. So I switched to Acrobat, and it seems to work better there. So just a tip, because um, I was yeah. I the problem I had was um, I kept ending up highlighting accelerated article preview. Yeah, watermark. that part gets it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. The watermark gets highlighted. Which, yeah, you know, I didn't really need to highlight. It's yeah. It's a little frustrating. I was driving in, and I said, "What am I going to do with this?" Like I wasn't able to actually highlight the second half of the paper. So I said, I'll try Acrobat and it worked. So there you go. It doesn't always work, but it worked okay. this time. All right, let's do some uh, email. Uh, Rich, can you take that first one? <laughs> Melanie writes, boxing mice. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I hear knockout mice talked about often and how they have helped researchers understand viruses. Will you please explain who makes them and how you get them? They are such an important part of research and I know very little about them. Thank you. Curious in California, Melanie. They're really good looking mice. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, the title of the email, Boxing Mice. I think that's Because I guess that's what you would think. Are they boxing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's illuminating to understand how the jargon impacts individuals who are not on the inside. So knockout refers to deleting a gene. So a knockout mice is a mouse that has had uh, what we call YFG, your favorite gene, deleted in it. Okay. And there are, uh, this has been, there's been a whole evolution of this because you know, a, a sort of standard genetic technique for understanding the role of any given gene in the life of an organism is to knock out the gene, destroy it, and say, what happens uh, when you break it in this way? Um, and uh, so there's been a, a long, long history in how to genetically engineer uh creatures like mice to knock out specific genes. And I think the current technology is CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. that's how you do it now. 
It is. So I think that one thing people should also be aware of, at least this is something that comes up with talking to students, is that usually you are going to do this on an embryo um, or um, embryonic cells and then put them into the rest of an embryo so that when you get your mouse, every cell in the mouse's body um, is missing the gene. Um, and it, as Rich points out. And so, um, you know, you are making a mouse where this gene is missing everywhere. There are some new, there are some sort of fancy techniques where you can make this happen conditionally only at certain times or only in certain kinds of cells. Um, but this is a, a situation where you basically made the mouse to be born without this gene for its whole life and in every single cell type um, of its body, which sometimes makes it complicated. There are also yeah. there are also knock ins where you delete a gene and replace it with mm -hmm. a modified or mm -hmm. something else. Yeah, um, and these are typically made. Which is in, just a uh, further confusion of the terminology. And they're made in labs. You know, labs yeah. make them, and then they sometimes make them available through like Jackson Laboratories and so forth. Um, but I remember when we wanted to. So the old technology, you would take embryonic stem cells, which are taken from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst, and those can be grown in culture. And you can modify them. And it was hard because you had to do, you had to introduce plasmids so that they would do homologous recombination with the gene you were interested in knocking out. And you would get one copy knocked out and then you would have to breed the mice to get homozygous knockouts. But you would take those embryonic stem cells that are modified, inject them into a blastocyst, put that back into a, a mouse, a pseudo-pregnant female mouse, and then it would develop to term. Nowadays, as Rich said, you take the embryonic stem cells, you can knock out genes with CRISPR. Uh, so we wanted to make a knockout of the homolog or the ortholog of the poliovirus receptor gene in mice. So, you know, the humans have a poliovirus receptor gene. Mice have something that's similar, but it's not a poliovirus receptor. And uh, for reasons that, well, we were just curious. We wanted to know what it was doing in mice. We probably should never have done it. Um, we never got funded to do it because we actually made the knockout mice. And, you know, these mice were fine. Homozygous knockouts. and But the males were sterile. The females were absolutely fine. So what are you thinking? So my student looks at the sperm and they're all messed up. So the deletion of this gene makes the sperm morphologically aberrant. It's involved in the sperm development. So I got very excited. I said, this is a contraceptive target, this gene. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually it is. Um, other people have done it. So I wrote Grant and they said I was full of it. And then everything I wrote was subsequently done by other people. And so what I figured from that is that I was not allowed into the club of mouse you know, fertility and development, right? So you're not a mouse geneticist. You're just a virologist. Go, go make some <laughs> so plaques that's my or something. Yeah. Knockout story. Yes. Um, Michael Bouchard, who worked right across yeah, from me in that's the right. labs, but yeah, he he spent years working on. That's this. right. You, you, were you there when he did that? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was there. I was there. I overlapped with him. So that we did it, and that was the end of it because yeah. I couldn't join the club. Never got funded, but it was a cool finding. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Um, Rebecca writes, Dear TWIV team, first, thank you for your time and efforts on this podcast. It has kept me sane this last year. I try to listen to the recent episodes and sneak in past episodes to catch up on the backlog I missed prior to discovering you in February 2020. Thanks from my dog, too. She gets in more walks. I'm just, just a technology professional who also instructs at a private Northern California university. This means the conversations you have had around schools and specifically universities always catch my interest and has direct relatability to my everyday. I wasn't sure if you saw this post that Rutgers is going to require COVID-19 vaccine. I know this has been a topic at my university, but so far our leadership keeps saying we cannot requiring it due to only having an EUA. Love to hear your thoughts. It's beautiful 52 Fahrenheit in California. And um, um, interesting. Yeah, I, of course, your, your university leadership has a lot of priorities um, that they're trying to juggle at the same time. I, um, 
This is something that's going on not only at Rutgers, but at many other universities around the country right now. This conversation, um, uh, University of Massachusetts and, and others are doing the same thing. Should we require it? Should we, you know, what do we do about this? And uh, a number of them are, are increasingly coming down on the side of requiring vaccination, which... Um, so just to, we, we probably are going to have to go into vaccine passports at some point, And I don't know if we want to open that conversation now, but, um, I, I will say that for very specific contexts, I do favor mandatory vaccination, but that's not to say that we should have vaccine passports for people to participate in everyday life. Um, in a university setting, there are unique issues where you're getting people together in a classroom. You're going to have a professor talking and spewing out droplets and students talking and spewing out droplets. And that's, that's always what I do. Part of the whole, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the whole uh, experience, right? And, um, and then if they're living on campus, I mean, there's more droplet exchange going on there that we don't need to get into. So there's, there's this whole community at a university, and we know um, from virological and epidemiological evidence that university campuses uh, are hotbeds of viral spread for SARS-CoV-2. This is not a hypothetical. Um, so if you bring everybody back to school and you're not requiring vaccination, uh, personally, I think that's irresponsible. I think it's the university ought to take a strong stance on this and either very strongly encourage or maybe even mandate um, vaccination. And I, and I think excuses by the administration probably have many different motivations saying it's because the EUA is just a convenient excuse. And yeah, I was going to ask you, what's the base? That's just an excuse. That's right? just, that's so BS. I, I've, but I have heard that. Um, so I, as you might guess, um, I have heard about some of these arguments and discussions um, I've, and being in a school uh, that is also in New Jersey right after Rutgers did this. I really heard about this quite a bit. Um, and I had heard the EUA thing from multiple um, different directions. Um, and so I had sort of had, as, as she says, that that's what her leadership keeps saying. And I had heard that from a number of places. And so um I think that that is out there. Um, certainly. Um, I will say that, uh, one thing that I know that Rutgers is doing is Rutgers is planning to continue to also have a fair number of courses online. Um, and so if you are a Rutgers student who does not want to get a vaccine, um, one thing that you can do is you can continue taking courses online. Um, and so they, they sort of, if you actually look in the fine print, there are some ways around this requirement um, to remain as a Rutgers student. Um, and so the question then becomes, well, what if you are a university that is not planning to have online courses um, in the fall? Um, is that requirement sort of fundamentally different than one where um, you are going to also have that online option? Hmm. Interesting. What are your thoughts, Rich? Uh, I have two thoughts. Uh, first of all, um, I don't know of any sort of official public health uh, policy that says that you cannot mandate the use of a vaccine because it only has an EUA. Uh, I do know that I, I think I know uh, that that's the policy in the military. Okay. That they won't, uh, they won't require their soldiers or administer vaccines uh, require mandate any vaccines that are not licensed. Okay. Um, licensure being a step beyond, uh, an EUA. I think I have that correctly. Uh, my only other thought is that, uh, is just to point out that referring to my pick from last Friday, that, uh, in general, uh, mandating vaccination is not unconstitutional. That's actually been tested in the Supreme Court, a decision back to 1905 uh, that says that uh, sometimes the government is within its rights to mandate certain behaviors in humans when it serves the common good. OK, so you can't just say this is unconstitutional. You can't make me do this. OK, um, you can't hold somebody down and vaccinate them, uh, but you can uh, refuse them service or uh, or find them or something like that if they uh, refuse the vaccination. And beyond that, uh, well, 
I don't have much patience with people who don't want to be vaccinated. Number one, <laughs> uh, number two, this is an evolving situation. You know, that everybody's going to have to work out their uh, work out their own thing. And personally, I agree with Alan. I would mandate vaccination for people coming back. I mean, I, as I recall, uh, University of Florida. Uh, used to require that people show proof of a recent or a recent, uh, relatively recent measles vaccination mm -hmm. before coming to school. So, uh, and, and this happens in elementary grades with other vaccinations as well. So there's nothing unusual about this, except I suppose for the fact that this is a new vaccine and an EUA, blah, 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 blah. But I, I, I think those are lame excuses. I think that's a good point. It's going to be on a state by state basis, right? Yeah, you know, whether you yeah. can have a medical exemption to school requirement, uh, right? It's going to be the same thing. But uh, what it strikes me is we've been talking for a year how to safely open schools again. You know, we didn't have, now we have vaccines. That's part of it, right? You can yeah. have vaccinated people and you don't have to mask in distance. Hey, isn't that worth it? Yeah, I would <laughs> yeah. say that's more than part of it. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Right. That's the way out of this. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to separate people that people do online. I just think get vaccinated. The schools should require it. Don't tippy toe around. Harvard, I think, is going to require it. Uh, I don't know about Columbia. We haven't heard yet. They they better. If they don't, they're silly. And I suspect this is going to correlate to some extent with schools financial situations. Hmm. Um, how, so, how does that work? I mean, as uh, as Brian just mentioned, you know, Rutgers is going <clears> to <throat> provide at least some courses online if somebody wants to remain at Rutgers and not get vaccinated. Um, for a lot of universities, they've taken a massive financial hit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Columbia is a real estate company, so they don't care. But um, <laughs> but but other actual universities that, you know, are mainly in the business of teaching students, they they had all their students cancel on them and they couldn't charge full tuition. And they've they've just the things are a wreck. We've had schools closing completely, just going bankrupt. Um, and I think probably what they're looking at when they when they wave excuses like EUA, which is just BS, mm -hmm. um, what they're really saying is we don't want to do this because right now we can't afford to scare anybody away. Yeah. Um, so that's so a that's I think unfortunate. that's a major issue. It's unfortunate, right? Yeah. What, what I would really hope would happen is that if anyone um, has their students who are uncertain about getting a vaccine, they go to the ASV website and go to one yes. of the ASV town halls to get their questions answered. Yes. Yeah, everybody. I'm kind of hoping that as this goes along uh, and people see more and more people yeah. around them get vaccinated Absolutely. and start, you know, partying uh, because they're because they're protected, yes. they'll say, oh, yeah, uh, I'd kind of like to do that. I totally well, agree. unfortunately, I that is happening. People are going yeah. partying um, <laughs> without getting vaccinated yeah, because other people are doing it. And that's how we're getting a new right. surge. I, I agree. Right. I think when you have, you know, 150 million Americans vaccinated, you can say, look, they're all fine. And they're not getting, what, what's the problem? What problem do you have? And then they'll make something up. I, I hope not. But I think you're right, Rich. I think it's going to change. Brienne, can you take, uh, no, you did that one. Yeah, no, sorry. Whew. Let me start over. Brienne, could I you take Brienne the next, next. one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Patricia writes, good morning, Twiv team. A balmy 56 here with cloudy skies and rain in the forecast this morning in Saratoga Springs, New York. Later this morning, 8 a.m., I'll be meeting with my virology students by Zoom to discuss the recent Twiv episode number 734. TWIV is a core part of our virology course curriculum, and I reserve a big chunk of our Friday class meetings for a discussion of the most recent TWIV. Today will be fun. On the recent episode with guest Susan Weiss, she described the paradoxical situation of detecting viral RNA with no other indication of active infection, as if the viral RNA was somehow specifically stabilized. It made me think that the stable viral RNA detected might be a form of CERC RNA. I did a quick search earlier this morning and found this preprint on BioArchive from December 2020. Circular RNA profiling reveals abundant and diverse circ RNAs of SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV, and MERS-CoV origin by Yang et al. on BioArchive. Once considered an inconsequential and minor byproduct of splicing, circ RNAs are incredibly abundant and diverse, with evidence that some may be able to function as messenger RNA or other regulatory RNA molecules. 
might be worthy of a future TWIV. Here's a link to the preprint. I'm keeping an eye out for the peer reviewed version. All the best, Pat. And Pat is an RNA biologist and associate professor at Skidmore College. Go primarily undergraduate institutions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. So I, I thought that the, they're mainly made by back splicing, but I guess not if uh, this is correct because there's no splicing here at all, right? December 8th, 2020. Uh, yeah, we, this uh, merits some looking into. I think yeah. um, it does. That's pretty cool. It's I think it's under peer review, most likely. And the folks in the circ RNA field are tough. You know, Pat Moore and, <laughs> and Pat Moore and Yuan so, Chang are, are two of them. And you, and, you so know, maybe, so maybe we ought to review it for them. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it's interesting because that could be a way because circ RNAs are thought to be storage depots for small mm -hmm. RNAs. You know, they hybridize to them and so forth. So that could be very interesting. All right, thank you, Pat. We'll take a look at that. Very interesting. Uh, Misa, Massa writes, thanks for a great show. You discussed the vaccine situation in Europe a bit, and I can give you some more details. EU handled vaccine procurement as a block, so they bought vaccines for all the EU countries. However, they acted late with most vaccines. During 2020, U.S. was almost always first to order from all the companies. The U.S. procurement was aggressive and yielded the best results. Companies seem to serve the country's first come, first serve basis, so the EU gets the shortest straw most of the time. There were also other some some other hiccups. Firstly, the GSK Sanofi vaccine failed, which removed a large part of the supply. Then the AstraZeneca vaccine faced massive production problems in EU plants, decreasing the output. AZ has other plants, but for various reasons, there are no vaccine imports into the EU. Meanwhile, EU has exported 40 million doses to various countries from EU-based plants. It has received none. This is partly because of export restrictions set by the Biden administration and the Boris Johnson administration. One of the most frustrating details is that J&J plants in the EU can't send product to the U.S. for fill and finish because it's likely that with Biden's export ban, the finished product couldn't be sent back. This has caused delays in the J&J rollout as they've had to scramble for capacity in the EU. Allowing fill and finish export wouldn't even affect the U.S. vaccination program a bit. To be frank, this single case seems quite evil from Biden. I can understand that Biden wants to bask in the vaccination globe, but is it truly right that high-risk people in their 60s and 70s are without vaccine in the EU while the U.S. is vaccinating people under 30? The risk for someone in their 70s versus 30s is completely different. EU has also one of the oldest populations on the planet. So the vaccine deprivation is really hurting people here. The daily death rate is around two to three fold higher than US at the moment. My 69 year old father with high risk comorbidities will be vaccinated maybe in April. I hope he survives until then. It seems the EU is now starting its own export bans if the situation doesn't improve. This will probably hurt everyone. However, it's hard to explain to people why vaccines are taken away from the EU into countries who are vaccinating young people. If you can, please try to advance solidarity in your administration. Okay, Joe. Okay, you here? Listen. Yeah, I'm sure Joe listens to Twib. Yes. The U.S. export ban is most likely killing elderly people in the EU unnecessarily because the vaccine rollout has been slowed out even further because of strict export bans by the Biden administration. Thank you, Masa. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows about this. Maybe Alan is familiar with this export ban. Uh, right. Well, this is this is one of the emergency measures that was put into place that actually made a lot of sense at the time, because if you'll recall back to March um, when everybody was discussing masks and PPE and people working in the ER in the face of COVID patients coughing on them couldn't or covering their faces with bandanas because they couldn't get N95s. And guess what? The companies that made those N95s were exporting vast quantities of them overseas because that's who was buying them. Um, and so we had this whole, this whole mess with just basic equipment for responding to the pandemic that we couldn't get in this country, even though it was being manufactured here. Um, and it was because it was being exported. And so these export bans were actually put into place, um, I think some of them under Trump, um, but carried on into the Biden administration. And it made a lot of sense right? Because we shouldn't be shipping our stuff overseas when we need it here. I mean, sorry, but uh, we do actually have to, it, it is the priority of the U.S. government to look out for U.S. citizens first. Um, and that should be the case for every government. They should look out for their own citizens and then try to help the world when they've done that. I think at this point, 
it does make sense to revisit some aspects of that because um, we do have we do have um, production ongoing for more than enough vaccine to vaccinate all Americans um, in pretty short order. And as this writer is saying, things are going worse in other parts of the world. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen real soon. Um, J, speaking of J&J, &J, they just had a big problem where like 15 million doses of their vaccine batch got ruined by a manufacturer that's got a history of problems, um, which was also supposed to be manufacturing the AstraZeneca vaccine, which has its own issues. Um, so it's not a simple case of, oh, we're hoarding all the vaccine. I mean, we, we do have our own issues that we're dealing with. I hope that this is something that's going to be resolved within the next month or so as our rollout smooths out and, and supplies build up um, and we have vaccine that we can export. Um, it, it does seem like they ought to be able to at least address the thing with sending fill and finish here and sending it back to Europe uh, if the capacity is available. But again, in the case of the J&J &J vaccine, they've got a capacity issue because they've had to rearrange this plant in Baltimore that just screwed up a whole bunch of doses. Yeah, I, I think it uh, makes perfect sense. And if anyone's listening who can do something, yeah, um, please, maybe it's just fallen under the radar and that they're but, not paying but attention. But I, I don't right? think, I don't think it's, as I say, I don't think we're hoarding the vaccine. I don't think Biden's yeah. being evil. I, I don't think that that's what's going on here. Um, it may look that way from, from Europe where the situation is clearly dire. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a lot that needs to happen here too. And we're having our own issues. Got it. Yeah. This is uh, strikes me as a good example of, uh, you know, legislation that winds up getting uh, applied in a fashion that doesn't make any sense relative to the initial legislation. Yeah. It's yeah. like um, not being able to uh, uh, send a cell line of African green monkey kidney cells to somewhere or even purchase it. There's, a, you know, cells that have been in culture for for 50 years or something like that. And now you can't get them or you can't uh, transport them because the African green monkey is an endangered species. Okay. That, that's nonsense. Okay. But that's what happens when you got lawyers. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to call them vervet monkeys, Rich. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. That's, that's the new term. Uh, Instead of uh, attorneys, okay. you call them vervet monkeys. <laughs> 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 oh no, you meant the African. Yeah, green. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. So, so technically there are multiple species of monkeys that are African green monkeys. Right. And so vervet is the more correct term for that specific species. Okay. Now I get it. It has nothing to do with political correctness. It's just no, no. scientifically it, it, it correct. It has to do with Brienne and other people spending too much time looking at primate file genetic trees. It's, it's taxonomic <laughs> correctness. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one, please? Uh, let's see here. Kim writes, hello, TWIF team. First, an immense thank you for your team, for your never-ending pursuit of accurate information and sharing your knowledge with us, the public. And to do so in such a convivial manner as your team does, making learning an absolute delight. Second, the intro with Arturo Casadevall was truly fantastic. Speaking up and being transparent about our larger problems in science always seems to trigger a bad reaction from the group at large. But as scientists, isn't our goal to improve not only our understanding of the natural world around us, but also the way in which we study it. Really great to hear this topic on your platform. Lastly, I have a favor to ask, read terminology about plasma and serum. Ah, good. Plasma is the protein-rich liquid fraction of your blood. The other components being cellular material, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Plasma contains molecules important for immune function, for example, antibodies and complement proteins, as well as hemostatic function, proteins in the coagulation pathway, for example, factor two, aka thrombin and fibrinogen, and clot formation. For example, von Willebrand factor. Serum is generated from plasmid through inducing coagulation. This I had to look up. This was missing from our discussion with Casa de Val. Serum is generated from plasma through coagulation. This causes consumption of all the clotting factors such that serum is in essence plasma 
devoid of clotting factors. Serum still contains the immune aspects of plasma. COVID-19 uh, convalescent plasma is in fact plasma, not serum. It contains large amounts of coagulation factors, for example, factor two and fibrinogen that are transfused alongside the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, convalescent plasma alias CCP is not processed to the level of serum. Can the team please be sure to refer to CCP as plasma and not serum? Yes, indeed, we'll do that. Sorry for a seemingly trivial verbiage request. Don't be sorry at all. The vocabulary is important. But these two terms are not really interchangeable. And in the case of thrombic complications associated with COVID-19, I think it is important to be clear about the coagulation potential of the plasma. Thank you so much for interviewing Arturo. I share his enthusiasm for the role of antibodies in vesicular space. A while back, you all discussed a paper from <clears throat> uh, Vitterson's group about how alternative glycosylation patterns on SARS-CoV-2 antibodies altered antibody function, also an area of research I enjoy. Would love to hear Arturo's take on CCP and glycosylation. Keep up the incredible work uh, and know that you are all greatly appreciated. Wishing everyone the best. Kim, who says just an immunologist who dabbles in aloe immunity, transfusion medicine, and hemostatic resuscitation. So as Arturo says, I find it hard to pigeonhole myself. Very informative, very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Kim. That's nice. Thank you. I'm sure Arturo used the right term. Maybe we didn't, right? <clears throat> we could have just kept saying CR. Uh, well, what was, what was uh, missing was a methodological. Yeah. Yes. I think our Turo used the right term, but that the detail about the fact that serum results from coagulated plasma spin out the coagulation yeah. uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, that, that bit, that detail was missing. And that's, that's important in, um, in understanding the difference between the two. Okay. Great, great, great. Very good. Listeners. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, great listeners. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Yeah. Sarah writes, hi, Twiv. I always listen with interest to your episodes and learn a lot. I have a question about episode 739 on April 4th because I think you are wrong in how you characterize randomized trials for plasma. You talked about the impracticality of doing randomized trials for convalescent plasma because the product plasma is variable. This doesn't make sense as a barrier to doing a randomized trial. The point of a randomized trial is to test the treatment that will actually be used in people to find out what the effect of the actual treatment is. If the treatment to be used in people will be variable, then we need to test the variable product. The key principles are, that Arturo talked about are to get high quality plasma and standardize it as much as possible by making sure the plasma comes from people who recovered from the actual disease and have high antibody titers and give it early in the course of illness. None of these are barriers to a randomized controlled trial if it is done well. Scientists do randomized trials of variable treatments all the time. You standardize as much as possible, but if you are trying to learn the reality of a treatment in practice, then you need to test the variation in application. In fact, for many treatments, the study is based on intention to treat analysis instead of treatment on the treated. That accounts for people who don't follow, follow uh, fully follow instructions, which is common in real-world application. Consider a diet study or a study of talk therapy, for example, which will have some variability from therapist to therapist. What we really need to learn is how the treatment plays out when recommended in real life, not the theoretically perfect trial conditions. Now, Arturo's argument that a randomized trial isn't needed in an emergency situation is an entirely different argument than arguing that the variability of plasma is a barrier. A poorly constructed trial, like many early plasma trials, is worse than no trial at all. But the answer is to conduct good trials, not to reject trials entirely. If the real-world treatment is to use local plasma from recent cases, then we need to do a trial on the real-world therapy process to really understand how it works. I'm concerned you're misleading listeners by focusing on the false barrier of plasma variability instead of the true barriers of conducting good randomized trials in emergency situations. Thanks for your ongoing work in science communication. Sarah's in Washington, D.C. Okay, good point. Um, I, I think what we were getting at, or at least as I interpreted it, was 
that the trials that had been done or that could be done um, were constrained by the variability because under the circumstances, a lot of the stuff that was being done was giving it in late stages, not properly quantifying the antibodies, that kind of thing. And so Artura's argument was we shouldn't reject the therapy on that basis. Um, and I was trying to point out that randomized control trials should certainly be done when they can be done. Um, but it can be okay to go ahead if you, if you have constraints on that. Uh, I mean, first of all, this was Arturo's position, right? Right. <laughs> um, so it, I would say Twiv is not misleading listeners if it's how you feel, but Arturo, that's his position. And in fact, I sent him uh, your email and we'll see what he says. But um, Arturo has been running a lot of this trial for the past year. So I'm not sure why you think he's wrong. I mean, in fact, a number of the trials have failed and it's probably because <laughs> the titers weren't sufficient or were variable. So I think it's it's a real issue, but um, you know, I don't have a, a strong feeling about it. But he did, obviously. He's he's very convinced. So I'm not sure um, why you think he's wrong, Sarah. Well, so, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't necessarily see uh, much inconsistency here. It seemed to me that Arturo. One of the things that Arturo was saying was, you know, the trials have not been good enough. We got to do better trials. Okay, uh, which is uh, the way I see it. What's being communicated here? I don't know. I think the idea was more that you can't just reject something um, completely in an emergency situation because of a lack of a a randomized control trial. Obviously, in a in sort of a perfect world, when you're not in the emergency situation, that is the way to do it. And my my concern with that discussion was that then people would say, well, what about hydroxychloroquine? Um, (laughs) Because that was a perfect example of people leaping onto a treatment that hadn't been tested. Uh, but that could have been tested and when it was, was found wanting um, and things spiraled out of control with that. And so I would hate to see that applied as the standard if we look at, at plasma therapy, which is kind of in its own category because of this variability. Well, I don't think we said that barriers to the use was an RCT. I think he said it, and that's the that's the message I got. So let's have right. him respond to it because yeah. um, we are not misleading listeners. I hope not, <laughs> Sarah. That's what Arturo said, and he's been a big person in the CCP, which reminds me of the Soviet Union, right? Yes, <laughs> it does. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Sean writes, "Dear Twivers." On foot of your episode on the use of convalescent plasma in COVID-19 patients and the controversy surrounding the absence of RCTs, um, randomized control trials, to legitimize same, I was reminded of this article from almost 20 years ago in the British Medical Journal. Yes. uh, And he gives a link. If you haven't come across it before, then I suspect it may elicit a wry smile from most of your team. Here's the conclusion from the abstract. Conclusions. As with many interventions intended to prevent ill health, the effectiveness of parachutes has not been subjected to rigorous evaluation by randomized controlled trials. Advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of interventions evaluated by using only observational data. We think that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. Love the show. Best wishes, Sean. Was this somebody's pick? Oh, yeah. yeah. Some, Long time years ago. ago. Yeah. Years ago, yeah. I think Rich had this as a pick. Well, I mean, this is a case where you can't do a yes, trial. Yes, of course. But, yeah. class, but you could do a trial, right? So well, I, I appreciate, Sean, that you were reminded of it, though. That's fine. <laughs> uh, Joyce writes, Hello, Twiv friends. I was catching up on episodes this evening. Just heard you mention on episode 739, the Pfizer study for adolescents. 12 to 15, the Moderna study, 12 to 17, Teen Cove. Alan suggested that Moderna has an, had enrolled younger children before the older ch- child teen cohort, but he may be thinking of another vaccine. Moderna finished enrolling Teen Cove participants 25th February and began enrolling the younger children for Kid Cove soon after. Rich seemed to question how Pfizer could determine 100% efficacy in their vaccine after only 19 COVID cases. Interestingly, those 19 cases 
0.8% of N equals 2260, or twice the relative number of cases that Pfizer used <laughs> to determine the vaccine's efficacy in adults, 0.4%. My twins are in the Teen Cove study. We felt very confident about participating after spending this past year with you on the podcast. The study has combined phase 2, 3, N equals 3,000 with two to one odds of receiving vaccine over placebo. Vaccine efficacy is listed as a secondary outcome measure. Antibody levels are being monitored regularly, and we are to report to the study doctor if my children develop any symptoms of COVID-19 during the 13-month study as they are now 16 and eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine here in Texas, my children want to be unblinded at their next clinical visit. I'm sure they will not be the first age 16 plus study participants to ask about this since other states are also lowering their vaccine age restrictions. Both serious about their role in the study, my children spent days fretting about this, but they are yearning to see their grandparents and move about their world, small and cautious as it may be right now with just a little more ease. From their reactions, we think my children both received the Moderna vaccine and hope they can stay in the study like in the adult version of the trial to continue to provide antibody and efficacy data over the next several months. This was a difficult, weird winter, but we have been heartened by all that has been accomplished and learned in the past year. Thank you for helping us process and understand it all. We got 84% humidity, 73F, 23C in Houston, Texas, and my neighbors are keeping me up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for the correction, Joyce, and yep. I apologize for the error. Um, so Rich seemed to question. So is, we don't know anything more about that, right? Rich? Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm not a statistician. I was just uh, griping about the small numbers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, okay. All right. Um, the next two are simply point outs by our listeners that TWIV was recommended on another podcast by Shane Harris, the Rational Security Podcast, which deals with national security issue. He's a reporter for the Washington Post, 43 minutes. That was sent in by Randall and Ann. Cool. Um, from the Brooking Institute. Oh, Ben Witties of the Brookings Institute Lawfare Podcast and numerous writings who also coined, coined malevolence tempered by incompetence. Uh, also chimes in about the excellence of TWIV. Uh, of a further interest is Shane pointing out how much he's learned from TWIV and how he plans to continue listening. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. Wh what's our role in national security? <laughs> no, but we have people, everyone needs to learn about viruses. The okay. Pentagon is intensely interested in viruses and has been for years. Yes, they have. <clears throat> and and uh, Anne also I points. Think that if there were pandemics elsewhere, that might uh, yeah hurt our national security. A bit. Yeah, that is that is very much a topic of discussion in security circles, and and as I say, has been for years. Well, excellent. Whether they all listen to Twiz, That's I cool. don't know. Uh, and Anne also points good. out that the rational security team also discussed the WHO report on. The Origins, Best Non-Scientific Explanation. Okay, so if you want to listen to that. We did a scientific explanation. And I am in um, negotiations with the three chairs of that committee to come on to TWIV. Excellent. Um, that's cool. Pe Peter Daszak, Marion Koopmans, and what's her name? I have to find this out because she's been on TWIV and she is a clinician in... At Copenhagen. Damn. Thea. Okay. Thea Colson Fisher. She was on Twift 576. So apparently they're the three chairs of the committee. I've been asking Peter for weeks and he never answered. And then he answered and said, We all want to come on. <laughs> okay, no problem. Great. Now I have to do the scheduling because you have to orchestrate it. Yeah. Peter's here and the other two are in. Europe, so that's going to be a little challenging, but I'll do it. We'll have them on. That'll be fun. Um, we may have to do it at an unusual time, so, you know, stay tuned. Not for the listeners, for us. Yeah. Let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have this week? 
Well, speaking of Peter Hotez, um, I have uh, an article that he uh, just had published in the British Medical Journal. Um, it's open access. Um, and it is apparently uh, a piece out of his longer recent book that is coming out. Um, though I cannot say that I have yet read that. That will have to be a post-semester uh, read. Um, but it's called COVID-19, A Disaster Five Years in the Making. And he talks about some of the kind of social um issues and social determinants that led us to be susceptible to a pandemic. Um, and uh, I thought that this was a really nice summary of a lot of sort of the, some of the non-scientific pieces that often impact whether or not we see large epidemics. And so for people who aren't as familiar with thinking about how some of the uh, social factors um, will play into pandemics and some of the specific things that have happened in recent years. Um, I thought this was a really nice kind of summary of all of that information. This is really good. Excellent. His book uh, came out on March 2nd. I forgot because he had mentioned that vaccine diplomacy in the time, preventing the next pandemic vaccine diplomacy in a time of anti-science. Yes, I right. bought it and then it's sitting on my shelf because I have papers to grade. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm going to get the Kindle and um, it will sit on my my iPad, I suppose. But I need to get that. Yeah, I forgot about it. That would be cool. Nice. Uh, Alan, what do you have? Well, while we're talking about books, I have one that um, is going to come across as a bit of a downer, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assign it because I think every, certainly every educated person needs to read this book soon. Um I know that's a strong recommendation, but this this is some really important insight. It's called The Tyranny of Merit um, by Michael Sandel, who's a philosopher. And if you're thinking it's a philosophy book and, oh, God, this is going to be dense, it's not. It's very readable. Um, if you pick up the hard copy, the hardcover edition, um, don't be don't be dismayed by the thickness of it either because about a third of the book is all the references and endnotes uh, for those who really do want to drill down deeper. Uh, but if you don't, if you just want the summary of it, uh, that's, that's in the first two thirds of the thickness. And it is a really um, compelling and disturbing, but also ultimately helpful um, look at what has happened um, globally and especially in the U.S. over the past 40 years and how we got to the Trump administration and the anti-science movement and the, the um, uh, backlash against expertise in general, where all this is coming from. And I think he does a better job than most of the professional pundits in putting his finger on the sources of that. Um, and it's just uh, the, the thesis of it is a, a lot of the complaint about uh, U.S. society and globalization in general has been, well, we're trying to build a meritocracy, but it's not really a meritocracy and we should try to make it more of a meritocracy. Sandel's argument is we should not want to live in a meritocracy. The term was originally coined to describe a dystopia. And when you start ranking people on their so-called merit based on market determinants of their skill value, uh, you will end up with a disaffected class of people who've been shuttled out of that and who are then stuck with that designation. And what's going to become of them? Well, what's going to become of them is a global wave of so-called populist leaders exploiting them to come to power and give us the results that we have today. Um, so I know this is, this is a bit of a downer, but I do think that this is a, an argument that you at least have to be familiar with and, um, and understand even if you're going to reject it. He All also right. proposes some solutions. All right. I just bought Excellent. it. I just bought it. Good. I just bought Peter Hotez's. Um, not too bad. Usually it doesn't doesn't cost me anything. So it's right. not bad. I, there, I follow a podcast where they do picks, but it's a tech podcast. And something that sometimes their picks are thousands of dollars. And uh, wow. the host will go out and buy it. And you say, All right, what are you going to cost me? <laughs> Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I'm going to start with a pre pick. Uh, which is, I just have to give uh, an update on the International Space Station for those of you who are not paying rapt attention to it. First of all, uh, Expedition 65, consisting of uh, a NASA astronaut and two cosmonauts, blasted off today and has docked with the space station. So we now have uh, four from Crew Dragon 1, three from Expedition 64, and three from... 
uh, Expedition 65. So that's 10 astronauts on the space station. It's getting a little crowded. Um, and uh, a week from now, this is the way they do it. They, you know, send up a new crew and then uh, the uh, old crew departs. A week from now, Expedition 64, which is our friend Kate Rubens and two cosmonauts are uh, returning to Earth. So that's on Friday, April 16th at some ungodly hour uh, in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. And uh, I wish Kate and her fellow cosmonauts all the best in their uh, return to Earth. Uh, and then I just have to add that on April 22nd, just uh, uh, a little over a week after that, Crew Dragon uh, 2 goes up. So that's another four astronaut mission. So now we're going to have 11 people on the space station. They got sleeping room for six, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, 11 people on the space station for about a week until um, uh, the, uh, I guess, Crew Dragon 1 uh, departs. And they'll have two Crew Dragons and a Soyuz capsule docked at the space station. So what do they do? Do they set up extra sleeping areas? Is that? Uh, they, these they guys probably rotate. Uh, yeah. They, uh, <clears throat> I know with Crew Dragon 1, one of the astronauts is uh, sleeping in Crew Dragon. Hmm. Okay. So they use the capsules. I see. At least to some extent. I don't know that they do a lot of hot bunking. No, Alan. I think they're <laughs> all on the... <laughs> all on the same clock. Okay. All on the all on the same clock. I, I mean, that's you know, the I, nautical solution: is you yeah. you only need as many berths as people right. are sleeping at eight hour shifts. Right. And I used to joke with. Uh, I've sent a couple of jokes to Kate. You know, who's going to sleep on the couch? Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, the couch equivalent is sleeping in the capsule. In the capsule. I don't know how you're going to sleep in a Soyuz capsule. They're pretty um, cozy. <laughs> at any rate, maybe we'll get the story from Kate somewhere down in the future. So my pick. This is a uh, New York Times uh, opinion piece that came up this morning by uh, a writer named Damon Young, with whom I was not familiar until today, called Racism Makes Me Question Everything. I got the vaccine anyway. Uh, Damon Young is a uh, black man, an author, uh, who's, uh, he's also a humorist, a satirist, and uh, uh, what he has uh, written here and his style obviously has a lot of humor in it, which I very much appreciate. Uh, his sort of breakout book was called What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker, which I immediately bought. And I read about the first page and I was in uh, hysterics. Of course, this is, um, I realize now there's a, now a double meaning to black humor. Okay. Uh, but that's, uh, that's his kind of uh, double meaning humor. At any rate, uh, I think that this is entirely relevant. As a matter of fact, it looks like we got a series of three picks here of social relevance. Yes. Um, because he's describing uh, something that we, uh, a black perspective on something that we have talked about before, uh, which is uh, skepticism um, in some of the minority communities, in particular the black community, about uh, government programs of uh, any sort and how that impacts on people's willingness to get vaccinated. Yeah. And just uh, one sentence here, he says, I don't trust doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, hospitals, emergency rooms, waiting rooms, surgeries, prescriptions, x-rays, MRIs, medical bills, insurance companies, or even the food from hospital cafeterias. Okay. My uh, awareness of pronounced racial disparities in our health system strips me of any confidence I would uh, have otherwise had in it. Um, he says, but nevertheless, uh, he uh, doesn't want to get COVID, so he's getting vaccinated. So I thought this was a, a really nice uh, description of that perspective and uh, one person's spin on how that turns out for him. Yeah. And I hope that maybe people will read this it will uh, spread and we can uh, build some trust and uh, get people vaccinated. Cool. Very good. Excellent. Uh, my pick is uh, Trudy Ray's YouTube channel. She started it not too long ago. Trudy, of course, uh, has been on TWIV a couple of times, uh, is uh, cur currently a patent agent, but has been trained as a virologist. And these are videos about viruses, viral disease, immunology, any science related to viruses. She has about 16 
or 17 of them. And she told me the last one is in three different languages, which I assume is English, German, and Romanian. <laughs> so, so. This there is you great. go. So that's cool. Check that out. Subscribed. And we have two listener picks. Jake writes, this week's Left, Right, and Center episode, a political discussion podcast from KCRW in L.A., features Rebecca Lee Smith, professor of epidemiology at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, talking about the university's successful implementation of regular COVID testing via saliva collection. I was glad to see a real epidemiologist getting airtime. Maybe she could be a guest on TWIV as well. And... Uh, Jake provides a link for that. And Ryan writes, Dear TWIV, every time I hear of you doing non-COVID news on TWIV, I think of the pre-SARS-CoV-2 era and when the show was meant for biology majors. <laughs> I will stay a fan of TWIV and its spinoff, given that I have listened to the show since 2018. And he, and he sends some links to the movie Perfect Strangers. <laughs> um, I don't think it was ever meant for biology majors, but... Anybody who liked science, maybe that's, you know, what you're thinking. And a lot of people now are listening who don't necessarily like science, but they want to understand what's going on. So thank you, Ryan. Ryan writes a lot and sends lots of links. And so uh, many of them don't show up here. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate it. Does anyone get the Perfect Strangers connection? I feel like maybe I watched this show some time ago. I don't remember it that well. It's a, oh, it's a TV series. I see. No, I think I watched totally it movie. as a kid, but I don't think I remember anything about it. In fact, that family is often stranger than strangers. Okay, well, maybe that's us here. You know, you, you look at us as family and we're stranger than strangers. Yeah, yes. that makes sense. All right, that's TWIV 742. Daniel said last night he wants to be on 747. He wants to be on the air, the big airplane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said you could be on the 777 or the 787. Right, yeah. yeah. Hey, we got you, your chances whole, of being on one of those are, are good. Boeing line to choose from. 787 is going to be a long show, but it'll stop in the middle and then pause for a while. And then... <laughs> right. All right. Uh, show notes are at microbe.tv slash twiv. You can send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. If you want to send a question to Daniel, that's daniel at microbe.tv. Don't mix them up. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Kond, it's Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove's at alandove.com, Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'd like to, th oh, and I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.